Hey y'all, Karen from the future here with a small announcement. I have started streaming on Twitch. If you are interested in learning a little bit more deep dive stuff about some of my roleplay opinions, or if you have questions for me, please join me on twitch.tv slash it's Karen Terry. Every Saturday Eastern time from noon to two. Characters will get injured. Characters will die. Things will happen to these characters that irrevocably change their personality and their goals. Spare Room with Karen Terry. Hey y'all, and welcome to Spare Room. I'm Karen Terry, and today we're going to talk about setting up a warring factions roleplay. Vampire versus Werewolf. Starks versus Lannisters. Death Eaters versus the Order of the Phoenix. Pick your factions. This is a warring factions roleplay, and I'm going to break down my method for setting one up. A warring factions roleplay is any roleplay where when you're crafting a character, you have to pick between two or more factions that that particular character belongs to. They are incredibly dramatic and exhilarating, and things are actually dangerous for the characters based on their faction. Events for these type of roleplays are super easy to set up. Make the factions fight. Pair people up so that they have to fight, have parallel parties that get crashed, things like that. And for these reasons, I love running Warring Factions roleplays. So here's how I set one up. First, your plot has to be reflective of the conflict. You're making a Warring Factions roleplay. That means a central plot element must be that the factions are at war. This is what drives the story of the roleplay. And the way that I do this is making sure the final sentence of my plot summary says, the war is now. And everything leading up to that final sentence essentially supports it and builds up to that final moment of the plot summary. So I am currently running a Warring Factions roleplay, so let's take a look at the plot summary that we have written so that you guys can see what I'm talking about as an example. In the words of our late great founder, Atlantis is a place for supernaturals by supernaturals. It was he who rose the ancient city from the ocean, established our government, and set us on the path to salvation. In Atlantis, we are not bound by what humans do on their lands. In Atlantis, we not only survive, but thrive. Liberty Medea. The year is 2020. The planet is dying. Unchecked human greed has driven many supernatural species to near extinction. The waters are too noisy for merfolk and selkie. Dryads and wares have less and less forest to call home. Supernaturals created from humans such as banshees and vampires suffer via human hunters who want nothing more than supernaturals to be extinct from the planet. 30 years ago, three supernaturals had a vision. Eos the Light Fae, Liberty the Earth Witch, and Bradford the Shifter. They founded a city by and for supernaturals. Eos the Light Fae used his magic to raise the sunken city of Atlantis from its depths and create a place that all supernatural creatures may live in harmony. This took all of his magic and his life. With his dying breath, he asked his friends to manage the city. Things started out well, but now the city is divided in two. The founders have each formed families of other supernaturals, not based on species, but loyalty. Everyone who is anyone in the city is loyal to one family or another. So what you can see with the last few sentences is the roleplay is primarily about the conflict between these existing factions. Particularly these phrases, the city is divided in two, and everyone who is anyone in the city is loyal to one family or another. So for your warring factions roleplay, review your plot summary, and make sure that it makes clear that there is a conflict between the factions. This is what makes choosing the faction for your character meaningful to the players. Consideration number two, keep your factions to a minimum. There is a tendency in warring factions role plays for characters to really just interact within their own faction. And this is totally fine and natural. The factions are in conflict, so of course you're gonna interact with your own. That makes sense, right? But because this is a natural tendency, we have some things we need to mitigate for. The more factions that you add to your roleplay, the more fragmented and sequestered the characters are going to become as they're interacting primarily with characters of their own faction. You don't want a character to be in a faction all by themselves, either literally because there's no other characters in that faction, or primarily because they happen to pick the faction with the less active players. 
Something to remember when setting up any role play is that 80% of your activity is going to come from 20% of your players. That's true in basically any role play I've ever run, any role play I've ever seen. That's not really something that we can change. That's just kind of the nature of running a group. It's going to be primarily driven by a smaller core number of people. And what this means for a warring factions roleplay is that if you have lots and lots of factions, some factions are going to be active and great, and other factions are going to be deserts. But you can avoid this problem of having essentially dead factions by having less factions in the roleplay. I recommend two. Three at the absolute maximum. I have never personally seen a roleplay with more than three factions where one of the factions isn't a total dead zone. This also means that I don't recommend running Warring Factions roleplays where players can create their own faction. Those player-created factions tend to just have the original creator in them, and maybe one other person joins, but probably not, and so those factions end up basically always being dead zones. In my current roleplay, we have two factions. We have Styx and we have Medea. You can also make a rebel character that's part of an Eos faction, but those rebel characters still have to pledge to either Styx or Medea. So two factions, three max in your Warring Factions roleplay, and you just avoid this issue altogether. And kind of building from this, consideration number three, do not allow neutral characters. Remember, your plot revolves around conflict between these factions. So if someone makes a neutral character, how are they going to engage with the plot? The answer is, most of the time, they can't. Sometimes neutral characters really can shine, but most of the time what they end up with is no matter how good the writer is, they end up being a side character, and no one wants to play a side character. So why do people ask for neutral characters in the first place in these types of roleplays? Typically in these cases, the player is scared of consequences or conflict or messing up, so they think a neutral character is a safe choice. They think if I play a neutral character, I can't mess up. But don't allow this. Once you allow one neutral character, you have to let anyone make a neutral character. And once you open those floodgates, there is a potential to end up with a roleplay where everyone is essentially playing a neutral character and they can't engage with the plot that you've created. Now, since you're not allowing neutral characters, what that means is we come to consideration number four. Make sure your different factions are distinct and compelling. What is the goal of each of your factions? Giving them different or similar goals will really help solidify how they affect the plot. I also like to add in flavor like symbols or mottos or things like that that help differentiate the factions in the player's minds. And let's look at the factions that we have for Atlantis as our example. So first we have Medea, and here's the description for Medea. Food production. They run the shipping of goods to the island, including humans. They also run the farms located on the rural side of the island and control the ports. When a citizen joins the Medea family, they're marked with a magical tattoo. The tattoo stays with them through shifts or other magical transformations. A gorgon is the symbol of Medea, sometimes simplified to just a snake or a cluster of snakes, and their colors are pink and green. Then our other main faction is Styx. So Styx is recruitment and entertainment, a family that brings supernaturals to the island and encourages them not to leave once they arrive. They run hotels, casinos, and other tourist destinations. When a citizen joins the Styx family, they're branded with a magical hot iron. The brand stays with them through shifts and other magical transformations. A Cerberus is the symbol of Styx, sometimes simplified to just a dog or two rows of teeth. Their colors are purple and gold. So remember, every character has to pick either Styx or Medea, and on top of that, they can also join the rebel faction Eos, so let's take a look at Eos. An underground movement united by their perception of Eos's original vision. The families were never meant to rule like this. Atlantis was supposed to be an egalitarian city for all supernaturals. Eos loyalists often officially join one of the two main families and continue their resistance efforts underground. They wear a hidden lapel pin that can be discarded at a moment's notice. They believe the threat of fate is coming for Atlantis, and as such, use a spindle as an agitprop symbol. You can find them on posters, in graffiti, and sometimes Eos loyalists make wooden spindles that they leave in strategic places. So you can see, each of these factions has a specific role on the island and a specific goal. 
Styx and Medea are vying for power within the system that already exists on the island, and Eos as the rebel faction is trying to dismantle that system. This is where having a Pinterest really comes in handy. So if you watched my lore book structure video where I talked about having an inspiration section and I showed Pinterest, then you'll remember that the brain processes images 60,000 times faster than it processes text. So in addition to your paragraph describing each faction, I would recommend having visual information as well so that people really get what each faction is about. All right, so you've got all that set up, but there is one final consideration. So our fifth consideration, encourage conflict and violence. Don't forget the war part of our warring factions role play. Player actions must have consequences and conflict must occur. Characters will get injured. Characters will die. Things will happen to these characters that irrevocably change their personality and their goals. If this isn't happening in your roleplay, it's not really a warring factions roleplay. This means, for example, avoid having prominent characters like whoever the leader is of each faction be an NPC. Make them a PC. That way, they can directly affect other characters and drive the plot of the roleplay. I would recommend in particular making sure that those characters are played by veteran players of your previous roleplay or moderators or trusted friends. And of course, make sure that all players are encouraged to create characters that have the ability to steer their factions along the plot. You must allow players to make big changes using their characters. If a character messes up, make sure there are consequences. Defectors, narcs, and rebels should not be running around town totally oblivious, totally unharmed. War is dangerous. That means the characters should be in danger. Conflict aversion and passivity has no place in a warring faction's roleplay. That means it is the job of the moderators and the admins to make sure that you have informed consent from your players on what type of roleplay they're joining. So take care in how your lore book communicates the plot. And also when you're having conversations with players, if there's a doubt that they understand that there's gonna be conflict, have that conversation with them. Make sure that they do understand that if their character screws up, their character is gonna have consequences. So to recap, when setting up a Warring Factions roleplay, there are five main considerations that I recommend to take into account. First, your plot must reflect your conflict. Second, keep your number of factions to a minimum. Third, do not allow neutral characters. Fourth, make your factions distinct and compelling. Fifth, encourage violence and consequences. All right, so that's my tips for this. That's my setup for this. Do you guys set up warring factions role plays? If you do, do you use a method similar? I'm really curious about your methods for your warring factions role plays as well. Let me know down below. And if you've never run one before, were you considering setting one up now that you've watched this video? Also curious about that? Let me know down below. And of course, don't forget to make it a great day.